Good afternoon, class. John here, checking in. I um, want to make some comments to conclude the lecture that I began in class today, where we were talking specifically about the different social and political forces or structures that helped um, build upon the Islamic world's momentum from the years of roughly 1000 to 1300 current era, which is the time period that chapter 10 in our textbook uh, focuses upon. So uh, my hope is to finish those out. And we've been talking, um, as you'll recall, Ibn Battuta, a well-chronicled or uh, a Islamic merchant and traveler whose uh, accounts of his vast and lengthy journey have been well chronicled uh, throughout this period of history. In fact, Batuta gives us one of the better glimpses uh, of the world during this time period, largely because of his extensive travels and also um, due to the uh, level of detail to which he, he documents those travels. So uh, we spent some time today, uh, got a little bit acquainted with Batuta and sort of the, 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 the distances and the extent of his travels, um, why he was a useful source of perspective, the role that he played, we talked about the Qadi, um, who was essentially a jurist or judge who helped uh, the uh, Islamic sultanates uh, of this time period managed the task of uh, governing a growing body of people, many of whom were Muslim, but not all. Um, we know that a number of non-Muslims also existed within these uh, sultanates. And so we get some glimpses of how government and society functioned, uh, some of the important things that, was, that were expected of Muslims, uh, that they participate in the uh, Hajj pilgrimage, uh, that they practice and live in accordance with Sharia law. And we know that um, the Qadi uh, Batuta, uh, Ibn Batuta, was uh, an important part of that. Uh, one of the things we haven't gotten into with Batuta, and not surprisingly, this isn't all that... Um, <laughs> celebrated, not a whole lot of attention is called to this uh, in his writings or his travels, but Batuta uh, had uh, more than one wife and he even divorced a wife not long after um, he uh, married her and had a child by her. There's also some evidence that um, one of his children died as a relatively young boy. He had a young son who died before Batuta had a chance to uh, meet him. Uh, Batuta had sent some money uh, to him, but was um, rather saddened that his son did not live um, a, a longer life, and certainly not a life that Allah allowed Batuta the chance to um, meet him. Now, Batuta was probably a unique character, a unique figure for his time because he traveled so far and wide. I don't think we can reach too many conclusions, but it is worth noting that um, it was typical for Muslim men to have a plurality of wives. According to the Quran, they could take as many as three wives, um, although the provision was that they had to be able to, um, to provide for them and attend to them equally. And so, you know, we get an interesting glimpse to some of the personal aspects of Batuta's life. So here we are looking at the Mamluk Empire, and you'll note the dates um, of the Mamluks. And this is really important because the Mamluk are a uh, important um, dynasty or empire within the Islamic world. And as we move forward in this class, and we've already sort of probably developed an appreciation for this thus far, um, the Islamic world was not a unified or monolithic, homogenous um, governmental system. Throughout the course of Islam's um, existence as a religion, there have been numerous Islamic um, sultanates, caliphates, 
um, empires, dynasties that have emerged. And we know that as a result of the Sunni-Shiite split that this has had, um, this isn't the only situation that has contributed to this, but the Islamic world has been fragmented at various times throughout its history. Well, the Mamluk Empire is one interesting chapter uh, in the various empires and dynasties that have vied for a controlling or a significant role um, in leading the Islamic world throughout its existence. Uh, the Mamluk Empire, from the time it was um, introduced, was based in Alexandria, Egypt, the westernmost um, point uh, of the, uh, the, the empire, and uh, it has a illustrious rule. First off, we should figure out who these Mamluk, um, the people who made up the Mamluk Empire were. Oddly enough, they were initially slaves. Um, we'll see as we start looking and meeting additional Muslim empires. It wasn't all that uncommon for Muslim empires to recruit their soldiers, um, recruit, recruit their harem, recruit their scholars from uh, regions adjacent to the empire in question. Right now we're speaking about the Mamluks, but later on we'll be speaking about the Ottomans and the Safavid. And we'll notice that they had similar uh, practices to this. The Mamluks were slaves, usually brought um, from the east. Uh, Turkic people uh, were brought into Egypt in northern Africa. And it was these Turkish boys who were essentially taken from places far east that became really important um, and decisive members of this Mamluk um, ethnicity. Now, the Mamluk Empire becomes an empire when these slaves rise up and overthrow their um, original masters. And they do this at a time around 1250 that allows them then to rise up and defeat, somewhat astonishingly, the Mongol Empire. We haven't gotten to the Mongols yet. We'll be looking at them uh, starting on Friday. Uh, or I'm sorry, starting on Thursday of this week. Uh, but the uh, Mongols were the most potent force in the world, absolutely difficult to defeat. And so it's really remarkable that the Mamluk um, Empire is going to be responsible for pushing back the Mongol menace, pushing it back east. And while we're on that topic, it's probably not a surprise, these Mamluk children who were taken from the east, these Turkish um, boys, they were raised in a culture that was largely nomadic and on horseback. So it's not too big of a reach to understand that they would have possibly had a um, means to fight off and compete against the Mongols who were also a nomadic horseback uh, military. So. Uh, Going back a little bit before the rise of the Mamluk Empire, it was under the Ayyubid dynasty, uh, which was a Sunni dynasty that had replaced the uh, Fatimid uh, dynasty in Egypt. I mention that only to suggest that up until about 1050, Northern Africa and Egypt was ruled by Shiite Muslims. They will be overthrown by the Ayyubids, who are mentioned here, and for the next hundred years, uh, a Sunni dynasty will rule in Egypt. It's this Sunni Ayyubid dynasty uh, that has brought in the Mamluk, quote, slave uh, soldiers and, and slave servants to the Ayyubid dynasty that are ultimately going to see their fortunes change and see these Mamluk slaves rise up, overthrow, and then establish themselves as the next great empire. Mind you, the Mamluks had adopted uh, Islam by this time, so the Mamluk Empire is going to be an Islamic uh, empire, uh, but one that uh, is sort of non-native. It's a Turkic-run uh, empire. 
They stage a coup in 1250 just in time so that they can then rise up and defeat uh, the Mongols in the following decade. So this is a really important set of historical developments that probably has holds consequences for um, the fate of the world, not to mention the Muslim world of this time. Okay, so Cairo is a um, important city starting in, well, it had always been an important city, uh, but it's going to be especially important with the emergence of the Mamluk Empire in 1250, and then once the Mamluks overthrow the Mongols, Cairo will become a new important ruling city in the early modern world. Um, Baghdad, which had been the capital of the Abbasid dynasty that we looked at last week. Baghdad had fallen as a result of the Mongol invasions of the uh, 13th century. And so Baghdad and its wonderful house of wisdom, its place of cultural learning and cultural um, accomplishment will now be essentially replaced by Cairo. And so Cairo in the late 13th century is the place to be in the Islamic world. In Cairo they establish colleges, these are called madrasas, they are still in, exi they are still in existence throughout the Muslim world today. This is where the ulama or the Muslim scholars learn and practice their craft. But we start to see in your textbook mentions this, by the 13th and 14th centuries there starts to be an, an alternative established within the Islamic world to those Muslim scholars or the ulama. And what this is, is the Sufi sect. And the Sufis you can think of as like populists. These are people who don't believe that in order to have an important relationship or powerful relationship with Allah, you need to have a Muslim scholar interpret your relationship for you. The Sufis stressed a direct and personal relationship with Allah, and this oftentimes went hand in hand with meditation. These Sufis were mystics who believed you don't need to have someone intervene or interpret the Quran for you. You can do that yourself. And uh, this picture here is meant to show one of the common practices among the Sufis. Some of them were dervishes or whirling dervishes, and they would dance as a way to sort of set themselves in a meditative trance that would connect them more closely with Allah. So the Sufis become an important player in the um, religious politics of the Islamic world, and they even cast some question and doubt upon the ruling structure within the Islamic world. The Sufis were oftentimes difficult. They didn't just accept the way things were told to them. They questioned and sometimes uh, didn't follow along all that well. You can think of it as almost like an urban versus rural divide. Um, the Sufis were like the rural, um, independent thinkers that did not necessarily go along with all those smart people from the city. So there's something of a cultural rift that's evident here. In Cairo, which is a good snapshot, and we have a little um, bit of a better understanding of Cairo through the help of Ibn Battuta, uh, but the social groups of Cairo looked something like this. There were the rulers who were like the government officials, um, the military leaders, um, the people um, in, in charge of budgets and tax collection, so on and so forth. You can think of this as the Mamluk uh, bureaucracy. Uh, then you have the ulema, and this is a picture of the ulema. These are the sort of the Muslim scholars who are uh, debating the important um, issues of the day. Next you have the merchants, um, traders and brokers. These would have been the Muslim merchants, those who uh, are um, trafficking the goods from the northern African Maghrib uh, throughout the Mediterranean and then moving them to points east uh, toward India and on to China. Then you have lower level um, tradespeople, shopkeepers. These are like the local sort of um, market and um, shop uh, owners. Farmers would have been toward the lower end. 
uh, of society. And then toward the bottom, you have the usurers, those who are lending money to people and charging interest, slave dealers. And finally here, and with that, I'll stop.